Well, I think the idea has been around for quite a long time, um, but the, in, in most recent years, I think most people would recognize that the rise of the Internet and the realization of, of how rapidly we, we, we could share information uh, by digital methods rather than uh, by print the printed page has made people sit up and think about the ways that we might transform um, academic and scholarly publishing. So I think the open access movement, although, you know, people have been around Leo Szilard, apparently, even in about the 1940s, was suggesting ways in which we might improve uh, sharing of information. I think it's the rise of the web that has uh, that has really pushed things forward. Very significant. Um, I mean, if you think 20 years ago, uh, there were only a small number of people talking about open access and probably only a small number of people who had good access to the Internet. But now that it's it's not quite universal, but it's it's heading that way. Uh, I think, you know, the idea has got out there. Everybody's heard of it. And um, certainly given the developments in the last two years, uh, I think, you know, every, almost everybody is talking about it and thinking about uh, ways in which, you know, researchers have responsibilities to share what they do. And, uh, you know, new publishers are coming on stream and offering, you know, new ways and hopefully more efficient ways uh, for us, you know, to get our research out there. So there was a report very recently uh, commissioned by the European Commission, I believe, which made the claim that probably over half of all uh, publicly funded research was effectively available for free on the Internet. And that's not quite the same thing as open access, which has a kind of rigorous definition, or even though it's not entirely uh, agreed, but the, given that, you know, we have reached or almost reached um, that kind of Rubicon, I think it's um, an indicator that there's no turning back and that we're very definitely headed towards a future in which the accessibility of um, research results and research papers will be much more, um, uh, much easier. Well, there are, uh, there's opposition from a number of different quarters. Certainly, uh, mainstream publishers and certainly the larger publishing organizations haven't exactly embraced it. Companies like Elsevier, as we know, have sponsored legislation or supported legislation in the US, for example, uh, which has specifically sought to restrict uh, public access to um, research articles. And that's been extremely unhelpful, and I think it's uh, served them poorly uh, as you know publicity uh, surrounding those sorts of actions was whipped up. We don't really know uh, what other lobbying activities they uh, undertake in other countries, in the UK, in France, in, in Germany. But one can only presume that you know that they are active. They make a lot of money out of scholarly publishing. It's a very good um, business for them, and of course, quite naturally, they they seek to defend it. Now, they are experimenting a bit with open access to give them um, their due, but I think that um, they're partly looking to protect a market mechanism that serves them well and that isn't really exposed properly to uh, full market forces. And that's one of the things that I am interested in seeing emerge from, from open access, where authors who um, will end up paying, I think, in the long run, if we move ultimately to a fully gold open access system, will really be thinking about, well, what is it that I'm getting from my money? And are there better outlets? And you will get better and more realistic competition between providers of publishing services. My other opponents are... Um, certainly among the research community, there's not universal support by any means. Some people see it as a way of just introducing vanity publishing. So if you have an author pays model, then, you know, what's to stop the author just paying to publish any old thing? And so you end up um, diluting the quality of the research literature. I don't really give an awful lot of credence to that because I th think that peer review uh, will help to control that. People in research are very mindful of the reputations that they develop. And so I think that, um, you know, the community-based or community-derived reputation is something that they will seek to protect. So I, I don't really fear that so terribly much. And then there's another cultural difference, I think, between the biomedical sciences, uh, natural sciences and physics on the one hand, and then um, sort of social scientists and humanities scholars on the other, 
where I think there's quite a bit of difference both in the way that they're funded, the natural sciences are funded much more generously, and in their relationship to the, 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 the work that they produce in the written form, so the articles that they write. Scientific articles are more often written as reports, you know, we did these experiments, here's what we observed, here's what we think it means. Now, there's certainly a, a personal investment in that. Mm-hmm. But humanities scholars, it's much more they're analyzing uh, ancient literature or you know cultural changes, and it's much more about interpretation and I think much more personal investment in the work as a result. And as because of that, I think they're more wary about open access. Certainly, they they're worried about the potential costs of it, although that's a very a debatable matter. But they're also worried about the push to introduce licenses which allow the work to be shared and to be text mined and to be reused, all of which I think are, you know, essentially healthy moves as long as they protect uh, the the rights and the credit due to the original author. But I think, you know, there's still a bit of conversation and debate to be had among these different communities about, you know, which mechanisms work best for them in terms of, you know, getting their work out there and getting, you know, a wide audience. Difficulty is actually accessing the funds that are already in the system to help to move to that model. You know, in the UK, for example, somewhere between 150 and 200 million pounds are paid every year for journal subscriptions and and subscriptions to databases. And ultimately, an awful lot of that money then could be switched to support open access publishing because um, in the long term, then you wouldn't need um, so much subscription-based literature. But it's, it's the difficulty is getting, you know, releasing that money because uh, often, you know, library contracts are tied up in large bundles uh, which have to be agreed with publishers. And um, so there are some technical difficulties in, in, in getting away from that, which is why a lot of people see pushing green open access as a, a more effective way to get us through the transition. Well, I think we're, you know, we are in line to see many changes in the publishing system simply due to the fact that um, there's so much more that you can do if you're presenting information in a digital form than on a printed page. It's about um, thinking about uh, providing all the raw data alongside the publication for reanalysis and for sharing, which is something that certainly the research councils in the UK um, are pushing for. So you can give much richer content. The, the area that I work in, which is in structural biology, we can often, of course, we're describing structures and we deposit the coordinates and we deposit the uh, original data that that is based upon, which allows some people um, to, you know, to look at them in three dimensions and to, you know, reanalyze the data if that, you know, if that's what they want to do. But often it's only specialists can do that and it would be useful if there were new tools developed which allowed, you know, presentation of the structural information in, um, in ways that allowed, you know, the three dimension, the, the three dimensionality to be appreciated, mm-hmm. which is something that's tricky to do on a static printed page, but on a dynamic uh, computer screen then, then one can certainly do that. But I'm also interested in the push to maybe get away from the idea that, you know, the journal is king and because that in itself has created problems because the hierarchy of journals uh, and the impact factors associated with them has become a, a corrosive influence on academic life. One can see that there were you know, good reasons for introducing them, but they've become too much of an obsession for people. And so in, in assessing individuals, in assessing researchers for promotion and for, uh, for hiring decisions, we tend to often to rely on, well, what's the impact factor of the journals that they published in, rather than thinking about, well, what has this person actually done, you know, and what's the science? And so I'd much rather move to an article level, uh, based, um, uh, um, metrics of assessment, um, so that it's focused on what people have actually done. And that also should help promulgate um, open access because it helps to clear the ground for new journals to emerge. If we have, as a, if we as a community um, start to think more about assessing articles and individuals rather than just assessing them on the established journals that they published in, then I think we are, we will actually do a much better job of um, promoting and enhancing the careers of young scientists and young researchers.